before I arrived in Nashville, or Asheville, after 37 years of wearing this uniform, I thought I knew what an old salt was. Uh, I was proved very wrong. And uh, as Captain Ingalls may agree, uh, Navy captains are never wrong, but when they're wrong, wow. <laughs> so having said that, uh, I must present my credentials because I'm overwhelmed by you fellas. Uh, I am a Mustang officer. Uh, I was a radar man third on a heavy cruiser during World War II. Uh, this uniform has to be turned, returned to the Renta suit company in Nashville <laughs> before midnight tonight, otherwise I'm out of luck. And uh, what I wanted really to talk about was the brief time that the heavy cruiser USS St. Paul served as the flagship of the Yangtze River Patrol. Uh, the St. Paul participated in the last days of the war and went to Tokyo Bay with an armada of Allied ships, hundreds. Uh, after the surrender was signed, we stayed there for it's about two months. Like and we had a mean guy with four stripes on his sleeve who made us polish brass, do rope work, holy stone the deck, all manner of tough things to get that ship looking like a bandwagon. We then went to Shanghai, arriving on the 11th of November, 1945, and Admiral C. Turner Joy broke his flag as the commander of the Yangtze River Patrol, bringing to life an organization that had been disbanded on the 9th of December of 1941. It was a brief tenure, but it brought a presence back to Shanghai that had been missing during the years of his occupation. It was a miserably devastated city. As many of you may remember, the Paris of the Orient was not very Paris-like at that time. It came to life again, and the St. Paul was part of that. 1,700 of us, young men, went ashore, stayed at the Park Hotel, went to the racetrack, there was an Army-Navy game, it was life again. Uh, St. Paul left Shanghai on the 6th of January, 1946, relieved by the USS Columbus, a sister ship, also of the Baltimore class. Columbus stayed there for about six months, and then once again, the Yangtze River Patrol was dissolved. So that fills in a little bit of history for a brief period of time when we did come alive again and we tried to carry on, in some small way, the traditions that you fellas established. In no way does a Baltimore-class cruiser patrol a river. Running aground is a very bad thing. So <laughs> we left. Uh, I have had one impression that stands out in my mind since being here for the past four days, that I am in the company of brave men, some of whom were probably heroes, but not spoken of. You carried our flag of freedom and didn't let your hands loose of it until it could be relinquished to another generation. And I salute you. Let your activities never be forgotten. There were just a few thousands of you out there. No aircraft. There, there, in numbers of human beings, sailors and marines that were manning your fleet, there were just not that many people. And within a matter of one year, it, from the start of the war, when you people took your hit, there were millions of sailors in the Navy. There were hundreds, thousands of ships within just a short period of time. The public consciousness of World War II comes from those millions of sailors that came in after you. So if you look at when the war ended, there were millions and millions of sailors and Marines who had those experiences from 1940, from late 1942 forward, and there were only thousands and thousands of you, and a lot of you didn't even come back because you were POWs until the end of the war itself. So, as the history was written and as, as the stories were told, and they were great stories, they were great, it was a tremendous amount of history that took place between 1943, 44, and 45. And 
and the pages of ink that went out to the public and the movies that filled the screens and the books that were written were written by those millions and millions of soldiers and those millions and millions of eyes that saw a period of history that, that you also experienced, but you experienced a part that they never saw. And you were hidden under a, a, a ton of media and print that also covered great events at its time. We need to let people know what happened to you. And that's where the next generation that's here in this room tonight will come into play. But we have media now that, that wasn't even available 10 years ago to let people know about you. In my case, I stumbled on this whole thing by accident. I'll kind of explain this to you. But I had forgotten, hey, I didn't just forget about you, I forgot about the Navy for about 20 years or longer. Whenever I came out of the Navy, because, you know, when I was in for the three years as an ensign and a lieutenant junior grade, it just struck me one day that this was too much like the military. <laughs> I did rediscover the Navy through a friend of mine that uh, invited me to ride. He was a CEO of an Aegis cruiser, and I got to ride it back from Hawaii and, and, uh, and all this gadgetry and wizardry from the new Navy just left me totally oppressed. And it reminded me of some of my own history with the Navy. So I began to get involved with the Tin Can Sailors. And that's where I heard the one-eyed salt talk about the USS Houston. And when I heard him talk about the Houston, I was saying to myself, why have I never heard this story? I mean, I'm a Navy guy, right? I was in Tin Cans. I mean, I've heard a lot of stories from World War II. I'd heard of the Java Sea, but it was kind of like, I'd heard of it, but I couldn't have told you much about it. And I wasn't really sure when it took place. But now, well, I went ahead and said this story was so good, so that's why I made that movie. And then I had to, then I had to build a website to support the movie. And then, and then from the website, uh, I began to I say, well, there's so much more here you can never put in a movie. So that kind of information goes into the internet now. And it's in that website, and it's more websites. And the email connections and the web connections that help you people find out what happened. There are amazing stories of people who find closure 60, 65 years after these events. People who had no clue what happened to their uncle. The guest book on the Houston site is just littered with entries that saying, thank you, I had no clue what happened to my uncle. I had no idea what happened to my father. I had no idea what my, what, you know, my, my mother's, uh, her first marriage, I mean, she had no idea what happened to her husband or whatever. But they, they just didn't know. But this opens up a whole venue for you to get your word out and more people learn about what happened to themselves, to their own families, and to their own people. And so I encourage you to use the web as much as you can. Last night was one of those examples of what happens whenever people find out that, that they have a heritage here that they never knew about. And last night, several people from the Edsel family, of course, there were, the Edsel was lost without a trace. And these people had no idea what happened to the people with the Edsel. But little by little, there's information that becomes available and, and people learn. Other parts come together and, and the web makes that possible. And uh, these people are, are finding closure to events that happened so long ago. What, what is it that makes you people so special? Is it you, you were there alone and you stood off uh, an enemy force with absolutely no help coming to you. It was like an Alamo situation. And yet we still don't have the, the media mass to let the world know uh, exactly what you did. But we will. We will. We will let the world know and you won't be forgotten. From uh, Dutch Cooper who was, uh, when the Houston was going down and the 
the chattering machine guns were still being fired from the mast uh, of the Houston. As it went down, they, somebody was still up, a Marine, was still up there uh, firing away at the searchlights on all the cruisers and the Japanese cruisers and destroyers that surrounded the ship. And uh, as it was going out and Cooper was getting away from the ship, he could see this flag <coughs> lit by a spotlights from the Japanese cruisers as it went down. And what Dutch said was <coughs> that that was that made him more proud than at any time he's ever had in his life. And here he was <coughs> having lost his ship, most of the crew and his friends, but to see that they had fought to the very, very bitter end. And he saw that flag go under, unsurrendered. And that's what made him so proud. Dutch is gone now, but the memory is there with all of you. You stayed with it until the end. And you fought till you couldn't fight anymore. And we're proud of you. And your history will continue. And I thank you for it. And it's a heritage for all of us. Thank you very much. Uh, the last fight of the Edsel, like the last flight fight of the entire fleet, uh, was extremely heroic. The Edsel faced four Japanese. The Edsel, the Edsel faced four Japanese men of war in a 90-minute running engagement. Uh, over 1,300 rounds were fired by these Japanese battleships, but they could never hit the Edsel. Uh, the Japanese recognized uh, some very superior ship handling on the part of the crew. And they were finally stopped by a massive air bombardment. And uh, we're, we're bringing this information to, uh, to the public in the form of a book next year, along with uh, footage that was taken by my grandfather uh, during his tour of duty from 39 on the Black Hawk to 1940 and 41. Uh, aboard the Edsel. Uh, I never got to say thank you to my grandfather for his sacrifice, and so I'd like to thank you instead. You guys did a hell of a job in the face of over overwhelming odds. Uh, it's inspiring to me and to more and more people. Thank you. Thank you, Captain of the uh, Submarine Task Force. Uh, my name is Jim Hewan. I'm age 65. I was born in April 1941, eight months before Pearl Harbor. My father was born in 1910, and when he was 20 years old in 1930, uh, we, were born, we were Cantonese, and Tian, my friend, is Shanghainese. Big difference. He speaks Mandarin, I speak Cantonese. We can't communicate verbally. Uh, my father was born about in a village uh, in, in Ping County about 150 miles uh, due west of Hong Kong. And of course, uh, Canton, which is now Guangzhou, was the biggest uh, city then. Anyway, in 1930, he was in Hong Kong, and we came from very poor peasant uh, families. Uh, my grandfathers uh, died in the uh, early, when they were like in their 20s. So my father kind of, you know, uh, was an orphan at the age of maybe eight or nine years old. He had two cousins and one joined the Navy in 1928. Can you believe that? As a mess attendant. In fact, Tien's father probably uh, joined the Navy as a boatman in 1923, and then became you know, a, a mess attendant in 1926. I mean, we're talking about history, folks. Uh, he joined the Navy, of course, because there were absolutely zero opportunity to make a living. And at the... Uh, Fantastic sum of $21 a month as a mess attendant third class. That was considered a fortune because in Admiral Tolley's book, he documented, you know, on page certain, certain page, that that was almost as much as an army colonel made in the Chinese army. Well, prior to that, my father was on the Mindanao, the Tausa, the Augusta, and the Houston, back and forth among these ships. Tien's father was on. You name all the gunboats that, that was on the Yangtze River, his father was on it. So when World War II started, uh, 
We didn't see my father for four, for four to five years. We had no money. My mother was selling her jewelry, you know, the little that she had. She also came from a very peasant background, and my parents only had like four or five years of Chinese schools. So uh, we were starting like crazy. Uh, my, my sister remember taking bark off a tree to, to make soup out of it, cutting the few grass, eating few mice for protein. That's how bad it was. So uh, that was about a year and a half at this time, 1942. She, uh, I was, she was still nursing me, so she, she had to take me with her, and she took two or three days by foot or by car or hitchhiking, whatever, to travel 150 miles to Macau. Right before Macau, and this is a true story, she told me that she saw some uh, soldier, uh, Japanese soldiers with uh, rifles and fixed bayonets. I was about a year and a half, and they were gonna take her away from her arms and just bayonet me for the heck of it. I mean, that shows you the Japanese cruelty uh, you know, mentality in, in those days. And my mother pleaded for, uh, for my life, and somehow they, they, they let me go. So that's a true story, and it's, we've always put, uh, talk about that during uh, our family gatherings. After the war, we moved, we lived in Hong we went back to Hong Kong, then the Navy sent us to Shanghai, and finally to Tsingtao. And in Tsingtao, that's where all the huge naval bases were. And uh, my father, since he was a U.S. citizen, was given the opportunity to immigrate his entire family uh, to the U.S., and we went to San Francisco. He was still on active duty, and we went to uh, Coronado, the air station. I think that was his first short duty in 16 years. And I said, how did he come to the, get his citizenship when he never came to the 48 states? And I just uh, recently found out that, and I was in the Navy, remember, that American vessel is considered American soil. I, I, I joined the Navy, was uh, assigned to a repair ship, and finally I found out what his, uh, the Navy did and what his uh, supply corps so I finally found out what the stewards uh, did. And I served three years with like Victor Campbell here. Uh, I asked the officers uh, at that time, did they know about the Asiatic fleet? And most of them said no. So, uh, and when I found you guys on the internet, uh, I, was so, I was so gratified. Mm -hmm. And in the four day, four or five days here, you guys are just like, 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 like fathers to me. And I really appreciate it. I love all of you guys. You guys are great. I, I salute you. Thank you.